Yeah, basically we're going to have a primer on forest oils today. So disclaimer, obviously, so soils courses are a 16 week course at the university level. Obviously we have probably now only about 45 minutes to get through a lot of material. Obviously we're not going to go too far in depth. However, I want to go over some important topics, obviously, that are of importance to woodland owners. All right. So that's what we're going to go through. And then we're also going to talk about USDA's web soil survey, the ability to use some technology to find out what type of soils that you have on your property and how they affect management decisions and how forest soils should affect manage, management decisions on your property. And it's especially important when you're dealing with afforestation and reforestation projects, knowing what kind of soils you have and what type of site limitations that you may encounter. All right, so ultimately, you know, today's presentation, again, it's very superficial, but we're gonna definitely go over some key concepts and terminology which you will find very useful. This is on Davenport Hall at the University of Illinois, and this used to be the Ag Building on campus. And basically, on the side of the building is the wealth of Illinois lies in our soil and our strength lies in its intelligent development. Now, those were the words of the president, Dr. Draper, at the time in 1894 through 1904. So obviously, Illinois, like Iowa, is very crop oriented, but the realization that soils are so fundamental to food, fiber, and the fabric of life, and how we have to manage them and treat them as a natural resource is really, really important. So what is soil? at the fundamental level. So scientists and natural resource professionals, we treat or think of soils as both a material and as a natural body on the Earth's surface. However, let's face it, most people think of soil as simply dirt, right? However, do you know that the definition of dirt does not equal soil? But dirt is actually soil out of place. That is the true definition of dirt. So you have dirt on your jeans, well that's soil out of place. Now soil is definitely an indispensable natural resource. And why? Because for food and fiber, you know, for timber, cotton, what have you, fruits, it's used for parks, nature preserves, lawns, playgrounds, it's that foundation. And it is the foundation for our homes, our buildings, our infrastructure such as highways, and buildings, of course. So soil is formed at a particular site and is influenced by five key factors. So soil development is a function of climate, of organisms, relief or topography, of parent material, or geologic substrate, and time. And time is very important with regard to soil development. So soils develop at, as a result of the interactions of those, those climate, organisms, relief, okay? So soils are definitely an integral part of forest management, and there's a reason why, okay? In Illinois, we're kind of the oddball, but in Illinois, soils data, soils reports, soils maps are required as part of your forest management plan. Your forest management plan will not be approved unless you have soils data, and there's a reason for that, because soils are the foundation to making sound, forest management decisions. And lack of basic forest or basic forest soils knowledge can ultimately lead to poor decision making. For example, I see this all the time, forcing black walnut on sites and soils where black walnut does not have optimum growth. I see it all the time. We're forcing black walnut on certain sites. I also see this a lot with conifers, all right? For example, blue spruce and eastern white pine. Planting those species, which are adapted to coarse textured, more sandy soils, but we force them onto heavier textured clay soils, all right? So you have to know about sites, you have to know about your soils, and you have to know what your species like. So we want to try to avoid forcing species onto sites and soils that they don't want to grow on, all right? They'll grow but they'll suffer over time. And probably everyone has seen black walnut growing off site. You've probably seen white pine growing in certain areas where you don't think white pine can probably grow. They'll grow, 
and they'll live. But ultimately, the root system starts to suffocate. It doesn't get enough oxygen. So trees give off oxygen, right? But the roots need oxygen to carry out respiration. And if the soils are super saturated, then those roots won't be able to grow properly and won't be able to support the above ground biomass. Obviously, I have a little Illinois-centric to my talk, but I'll, I'll try to include Iowa and Wisconsin when appropriate. In Illinois, there are 562 different soils series. And then throughout the world, there are over 21,000 different soil series. And I'll define what soil series are. All right? And ultimately, the product of sometimes very subtle differences. So sometimes just a 2% or 3% grade difference can result in a different soil series. And drainage, which we're going to talk about, is very important for certain tree species. There are 12 soil orders nationwide throughout the world or major soil groups in the soil classification system. And I'm not going to go into that today, all right? It's, not, it's just too much information. But there are 12 soil orders. And soil orders are distinguished from one another on the basis of several critical horizons. Or horizons, another term, are layers. Have you ever seen a soil pit or a soil profile and notice different colors throughout the five feet or six feet or three feet of soil that you have? Those are horizons. And those help basically define which soil series we have. All right? So 12 soil orders throughout the world. Six are of importance in Illinois. And in Iowa, it's almost identical. And in Wisconsin, we would add one more. So in Illinois, we have alpha sols. Alpha sols are our traditional forest soils. So basically, those soils developed under forest vegetation, alpha sols. Molosols are also extremely common in the state of Illinois. Molosols developed under prairie vegetation. Molosols have really deep organic layers. They're typically very dark, and they're extremely productive for row crop agriculture, as are alpha sols, but not nearly as much. The only difference, not, I shouldn't say the only difference between an alpha sol and a molosol, is that molosols will have more organic matter, okay? They'll simply have more organic matter because prairie plants, the root systems are extremely fibrous, and those root systems, as they degrade and die over time, add to that organic matter pool in the soil. Entosols are recently developed soils. Frequently, we find them in the floodplains. Entosols are frequently found in the floodplains. Inceptosols are young soils as well, typically found on sloping topography. Histosols are the organic, the heavy soils that are just dark black, okay? Basically, they're black all the way through. And a lot of times, you find them in the bogs. Okay, the really wet areas, swamps and bogs, you'll find histosols. Not very prevalent in the state of Illinois. And the last but not least are altosols. Altosols are our oldest soil orders. Okay? In Illinois, in southern Illinois, where the Wisconsin glacial episode did not reach, we have certain altosols, which are really old soils. Okay, but it's a very low number. So the role of forest soils. Ultimately, what are soils? It's the medium in which plants grow. And if you didn't know, trees are plants. But they're perennial, okay, and woody. Forest soils often dictate the diversity and abundance of vegetation. And foresters frequently can determine the productivity of a site, how productive it is, you know, how many board feet, how many cubic feet, how many cords of wood those soils can grow, all right? So foresters can tell just by the distribution, abundance, and diversity of vegetation, they can basically determine the productivity of the soils just by looking at the vegetation on the site. And even the height of the trees or the form of the trees, we can actually ascertain whether these are good soils, average soils, or poor soils. Soil parent material, it's one of those soil forming factors, right? It's really important. So parent material is the geologic material in which soils form, all right? 
And many of the properties and uses of soils are inherited from the parent material. And we'll discuss the different types of parent material. In Illinois, most parent material can be traced back to the Pleistocene epoch. Basically, that's the last glacial episode, which for the majority of Illinois is the Wisconsin epoch that goes back, or glacial episode, which goes back 12,000 to about 23,000 years ago. All right, so I'm going to list off some important parent, parent material types. Luss. Luss is wind-blown silt, okay? And it's extremely common parent material in the Midwest. Aeolian sand is wind-blown sand. Glacial drift is deposited in, in association with glacial ice. Components of glacial drift include till, outwash, and lacustrine sediments. Glacial till is actually deposited in contact with the ice itself and varies in texture. And it is often unsorted, okay? It's unsorted material. So it'll have different size. And frequently, you'll have lus over till. Glacial outwash is another term. And unlike glacial till, it is sorted. So a lot of times you'll have just sand deposits or gravel deposits. That's what we refer to as glacial outwash. Basically, we had rivers that flowed from the glaciers, and because of the torrent or speed or velocity of that water, it was able to sort the material, where the heavier materials were carried farther away from the glacier. Lacustrine sediments, just think Lake Lacustrine, basically deposited in lakes. Uh, people don't think that sometimes you had lakes on top of glaciers. And Basically, you had lakes created from glaciers, okay, glacial lakes. Alluvium is recent material deposited by streams or rivers. Residuum is common in the driftless area where you have soil material that's directly weathered from rock. So up here in the driftless area, you have residuum, you have bedrock, we have a lot of limestone up here. And on top of that limestone, you'll have a lus cap. And sometimes that lus cap is extremely deep. And then right under that lust cap is that bedrock, okay? But the primary parent material in that case would be the lust cap, because that's what's going to affect soil development and ultimately the vegetation that you have on site. And then you can have organic matter as your parent material, some of those histosols, some of those boggy areas, basically it is broken down organic matter is the parent material itself. Soil mapping units. So how many of you have ever looked at a soil survey? Anyone? Okay. That's probably why you're here, right? You know, learn a little bit more about soil surveys. So you've probably seen numbers. And then, so these numbers are not arbitrary. They actually have meaning to them. So soil mapping units are areas defined and named in terms of soil properties. Okay? So every soil series is going to have a soil mapping unit. And they are the basic units of a soil map. So in this case, I have a scenario. So soil mapping unit 3107A. Okay, that actually has meaning. And in Illinois, that is sawmill silty clay loam. Actually, that should be sawmill silty clay loam, not drummer silty clay loam. So the series is actually sawmill. The slope phase, slope phase is what percent slope? So if you ever see letters at the end of a soil mapping unit, they will indicate the percent slope. And in this case, the letter A represents 0 to 2% slopes. And it goes from A all the way up to G. And G percent slopes are the steep slopes, all right? 35 to about 70% slopes. And you also have flood frequency. And that's the letter 3 in front of the 107A. And what that tells us is the flood frequency. So a lot of times, floodplain soils will be prefaced by a number. And that tells us whether it's a frequently flooded site, which is the three. One equals frequently flooded and very wet. Those type of soils would be poor walnut soils, bad walnut soils. And then the letter eight means occasionally flooded. So basically what I'm helping you do here is try to define what those soil mapping units are. Because for a lot of people, they're just numbers and letters. But there's a method behind the madness of soil scientists, believe me. 
So soil series are made up of groups of soils that have very similar soil profiles, right? The profile, those layers or horizons that you see in a soil itself. And the series name is commonly associated to a nearby town, okay? Believe it or not. And you can actually look up the soil series. The United States Department of Agriculture has a plethora of soils related information, okay? They have a ton of soil scientists. So here's an excellent website if you're kind of a soils nerd or a forestry nerd and you really want to know what those soils, soil series mean, then you can actually look them up on the web. I've mentioned soil profiles now, and here's kind of a schematic. This is more of a you know, cartoon and not a true illustration. But do you like this? Got dirt. Typical soil scientists. That's their humor level. But for most soil profiles, typically the top horizon is the O horizon. That's where you have all that organic input. Beneath the O horizon is the A horizon. That's where you start to get some degradation of the uh, mineral matter mixed in with the organic matter. E horizons, not all soils have E horizons. Spotosols have classic E horizons. And spotosols are very common up in north Wisconsin. All right? When you get up to the north woods, you start to get a lot of spotosols. And they will develop this E horizon. And it's very unique and it's very easy to identify because it's white. It's like ashy gray. It's white in color. And that's a zone of leaching, OK? So minerals and material are being leached down through the soil profile. And then ultimately, below the E profile is the B horizon. And that's where you start to get reaccumulation of minerals, nutrients, and uh, aluminum oxides, and things like organic material. The C horizon is partially altered parent material. And then finally, at the very bottom, is the unweathered parent material. Remember where I mentioned where you might have a lust cap up here in the driftless area, and under that lust cap is bedrock. And in a lot of instances up here, it's limestone. Soil texture is a very, is a very important concept and term you should probably know, because ultimately, it can affect fertility, and it affects soil drainage. Very, two very important items to consider when planting trees and managing forests. Soil texture is based on percent silt, sand, and clay. And soil scientists developed this textural triangle. And if we determine, for example, a soil that has 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay, the red dot basically indicates that the soil texture comes out or is classified as a loam. And loam soils are really nice soils because they play well with almost all species. They typically have very decent fertility and they have good internal soil drainage, which is really important for certain hardwood species and certain conifer species. How many black walnut lovers do we have out there? People that just love growing black walnut. All right, I knew you, yeah. But even species like northern red oak and white oak, you have to have good soil drainage. And we're going to talk a little bit about walnut and white oak and what type of soils they require. And it's unique because these new soils reports or the web soil survey system basically will ascertain if you have a site or soils that are suitable to be growing black walnut or white oak. So you can get positive feedback by doing a soils report for your property. You'll see that a certain soil series, maybe like sawmill, uh, silty clay loam, which I showed you, basically it's somewhat marginal for black walnut growth and development. It'll grow there, but, the, but it's not an optimum site. And this gives you an idea, this schematic gives you an idea of the size of the particles itself. So sand, obviously, is a much larger particle, even though it's small, right, in your hand or finger, and this is obviously blown up, but, you know, 0.05 to 2 millimeters in diameter. And then compare that to silt. And silt's a very unique uh, soil particle. It helps with water retention, OK? So silt is great at water retention. And then you have the smallest particle size, which is clay. And clay is really important for basically fertility, basically cations, you know, how much magnesium, how much calcium and the positive and negative charges that are attracted or associated with clay. So oftentimes, clay and organic matter, they're really important for the fertility of a soil. 
And if you have a, a pure sandy soil, pure sandy soils are typically uh, extremely well drained and typically don't have a lot of fertility associated with them because they're mostly sand and very little clay. Here are some essential plant nutrients that are of utmost importance to not only growing row crops, but obviously our trees as well. On our left, we have micronutrients, and they are soil derived. They are typically derived from the soil, the parent material or the geologic substrate. Boron, chlorine, believe it or not, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, and zinc, all micronutrients. And then we have our primary macronutrients, and they are non mineral, okay? And carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, those are non mineral, but essential macronutrients. And then we have our primary macronutrients that are soil derived, okay? So some soils, some geologic substrate, we can actually get nitrogen from. But otherwise, nitrogen is usually attributed to how much organic matter you have in your soils. Phosphorus and potassium, obviously very important macronutrients. And then secondary macronutrients that are also soil derived, which are almost equally important, is your calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Soil pH. How many have ever heard of soil pH? You've probably heard of it. Why is it important? It's really important. So soil pH varies by soils, and it can also vary by depth within the soil profile itself. Okay? And pH, I'm going to get a little scientific on you a little here, but pH is defined as a negative log of the hydrogen ion activity in the soil solution. So the more hydrogen ions you have in the soil, the lower the pH. The lower the pH is, the more acidic the soil, all right? Generally, soils become more acidic as they leach and weather over time. So here in the Midwest, the areas that receive that, you know, Wisconsin glacial episode, those soils are very young, geologically speaking. They're only 12,000 to 23,000 years old. That is very, very young geologically, and therefore, they are typically very nutrient rich. Unlike soils in extreme southern Illinois, which has not received a glacial in a very long time, those soils are generally more, le or less fertile, okay? They're less fertile because the soils are over 200,000 years old, okay? Big difference. So that time and that weathering basically leaches out a lot of those cations or macronutrients such as calcium and magnesium that are really important for, for growth and development of tree species. So soil pH and nutrient availability. And this is really important because as the pH changes, certain nutrients become more soluble or insoluble, okay? So pH renders nutrient availability in a lot of cases. So you have to be able to match your species with the pH on your soils or on your site. One of the most common phone calls I get in central Illinois is pin oak. My pin oak is yellow. My pin oak is chlorotic. Well, oftentimes it is the pH of that soil that renders that iron unavailable for uptake. And that iron chlorosis, that yellowing of the foliage, means that tree is not being able to pick up oftentimes that iron and that manganese. It's not that that iron and manganese is absent in the soil. It's there. It is the pH of the soil that renders it unavailable for uptake. So it's really important that you understand pH, not the entire scientific concept, but being able to match pH with species selection. Because certain species prefer acidic soils, and certain species are a little more demanding and they like near neutral or alkaline soils. Alkaline is anything that's over seven on the pH scale, and acidic is anything under seven, and seven is neutral. And we're gonna talk a lot about walnut, and walnut's one of those unique species where it's pretty nutrient demanding, okay? And there's a sweet spot for black walnut, and I've identified it up here on the chart, and it's that kind of 6.0 to 7.5 range. So that's kind of that optimum black walnut suitability for pH. That's where black walnut thrives. Can it grow outside that optimum level? Absolutely. Okay, it can grow in more acidic sites or on more acidic sites, and it can grow on more alkaline sites. But the optimum growth will not be there. 
So I realize that this is relatively small font for this room, but there are optimum pH ranges based on certain species types. And if you can't read this, not a problem. It's going to be on the web so that you can take a look at it and you can make some notes. But you'll see that certain species um, have a preference for more acid soils, you know, 4.5, 5.0, 5.5. Then other species have a preference for more alkaline soils, okay? And I'm not going to go through each and every one, but I just want you to know that species, tree species, have a preference for pH. And if you force species to grow on sites that it's not preferable to, the trees will respond negatively, all right? Growth will be reduced, and you can actually develop problems in the foliage. Foliage is usually a good indicator of pathogens, and it also can be a great indicator of fertility issues. Orga organic matter. Organic matter is it's a really hot topic right now because we're talking about carbon sequestration, the importance of trees and the carbon system. But uh, organic matter is this collective term, right? So it's based on, you know, it's carbon-based inputs and typically from organisms and decomposition of plants and roots. So that's where we get most inputs from organic matter. And the org organic matter is typically concentrated on the surface of the soils. So soil erosion can be a huge issue for us. And organic matter helps with fertility, especially things like nitrogen and phosphorus. And nitrogen is by far the most demanding nutrient for all plants. And sometimes our soils are nitrogen poor, which is why a lot of farmers apply a lot of nitrogen to their fields. The amount of soil organic matter within the soil is frequently used as an indicator of soil health and soil quality, all right? So there are a lot of initiatives through the U.S. Department of Agriculture right now kind of promoting organic matter retention, all right? Tillage practices out on farm fields, all right? Implementing best management practices on farm fields and on your forest land especially during logging operations, harvesting operations, you know, doing water bars, maintaining streamside management zones, okay? That's all for the protection of erosion for soil, and ultimately the majority of that organic matter is on the soil surface. Organic matter soils containing more organic matter are generally considered to be more productive. This is very true, okay? Because organic matter after decomposition releases a lot of macronutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, which are really important for growth and development of plant species. Soil organic matter can be found throughout the entire soil profile. However, the majority is in the upper 30 centimeters of the soil. Erosion is a major cause of soil organic matter loss and topsoil, of course. How many of you have had a timber sale by a show of hands? Did you, your forester, did you require best management practices to be used during that logging operation by a show of hands? Yeah, not as many. So ultimately, soil best management or best management practices are real important for soil conservation, protecting our streams, our water quality. And again, this organic matter, it's a big deal because a lot of our fertility comes from that organic material. And uh, Here's just kind of a, the soil carbon cycle, and uh, we're going to go ahead through that. I'll kind of get through some things. The impact of native vegetation. So ultimately, the original native vegetation kind of dictates soil development, and ultimately the distribution of organic matter in the soil itself. So the oranges area in Illinois, that basically represents where those mollusols are, and those mollusols developed under prairie vegetation. So you can pretty much see where the prairie vegetation was in the state of Illinois. And then the green areas, those are more of our alpha sols. So those soils develop primarily under forest vegetation. Soil moisture classes are also important for site selection and planting species where they need to be, where they ought to be for optimum growth and development. So you have summit positions, you have shoulders, you have back slopes. Shoulders on slopes are typically where you have a high amount of basically drainage. And then the drainage slowly decreases, you have so more soil moisture as you go mid-slope, foot-slope, and toe-slope. 
And soil moisture classes are a function of soil texture, how much sand, how much silt, how much clay the soils contain, how much organic matter content. The more organic matter content you have, the more soil moisture you have. Landscape position, which are those simple slopes diagram right there. Aspect, whether you have a north facing aspect, south facing aspect. North facing aspect, aspects are typically cooler, right? They get less direct sun. So they're typically gonna have higher soil moisture content. Where south facing aspect slopes, they receive more direct sunlight. And so they're typically, but not always, gonna be drier. And the vegetation's gonna be different too. And obviously precipitation plays a major role in how much soil moisture you have. And we have soil moisture classes. Basically, the seven soil moisture classes in Illinois are described, are used to describe the plant communities we, that we have. And we have different plant communities, but these are the major soil moisture classes for our, our forest communities. Xeric, Xeric sites typically mean that it's excessively drained, all right? Those are poor sites. And basically, the trees are extremely stunted, all right? They're extremely stunted because they typically have low fertility and they have low soil moisture. The next soil moisture class is dry. They're somewhat excessively drained, okay? And species are going to be dictated by that dry soil moisture regime. And in Illinois, our dry soil moisture class sites, they're typically oak dominant. All right, oak is the most dominant species. You're not gonna get sugar maple growing or red maple growing on these dry sites. They can't compete with the oak because the oak requires less fertility and less water compared to a red maple or a sugar maple or a basswood. Dry mesic basically means well-drained soil moisture, okay? And dry mesic is the most common soil moisture class in Illinois and probably Iowa as well, okay? This is typically where we see our oak hickory forests or on these dry mesic soil moisture classes. Then we move on to these mesic, and mesic means moderately well-drained, which ultimately means we have more soil moisture. Then we move to wet mesic. Wet mesic, you can find this soil moisture class on upland forests, but it's also extremely common in our riparian forests and wet mesic sites are somewhat poorly drained, and you can get decent walnut development on these wet mesic sites in the forest bottoms. Wet means poorly drained, and then hydric are the very poorly drained. So think of hydric as your swamps or your bogs, okay? And here are some soils, plant communities. Again, oak hickory is extremely common for our dry mesic sites. Mixed hardwoods, we find those on that dry mesic to mesic translate transition zones. Maple beech basswood, those types of forests have more soil moisture. Those are more of the mesic soil moisture classes. Northern hardwoods, northern flatwoods. How many of you have ever heard of a forest, uh, a, a flatwood community? Okay, they're kind of unique in that the water table is really close to the soil surface and therefore you have really poor soil drainage and you have very unique plant assemblages. And in Illinois, we get these pin oak flatwoods, which are kind of unique. And we also get swamp white oak developing on these flatwood sites. But they're very poorly drained, and, uh, and they're typically wet, believe it or not. And then mixed bottom on hardwood. Soil moisture basically, again, goes to relative growth and competition potential for major tree species. This diagram is for those from Wisconsin. So ultimately, you can see where the species prefers to grow on a soil moisture level, okay? So ultimately, I'm gonna stay in the front here. So red oak, mesic site, you're gonna have optimum growth and development, okay? If you have a mesic type soil moisture regime. Where does red oak not like to grow very well? On very wet sites or extremely dry sites. So it's very helpful to understand these soil moisture regimes to know which species to manage for and which species to plant. Forest site is uh, basically an area considered in terms of its environment, particularly as it determines the type and quality of the vegetation that it can carry. And we use qualitative site indicators and quantitative site indicators. And most of you are probably gonna be more familiar with the quantitative site indicators. So site quality, basically, the topographic position, the aspect of the land, 
Those are all indicators of site quality. So narrow ridges, upper slopes, steep slopes, um, south aspect, coarse textured soils, poor or excessive drainage. Those are relatively unfavorable sites to grow high quality hardwoods, okay? Certain conifers do well there. Red pine, for example, does great on extremely droughty, sandy soils. But it's not going to be an optimum site for say white oak, northern red oak, or black walnut, all right? So there are qualitative indicators just by looking at a site, just by looking at topography on whether it's gonna be a good site for certain species to grow or to manage for those type of species on that particular site. For soil productivity on a quantitative level, and this is probably what most of you are familiar with. So when we think of soil productivity, often we'll think of growth and yield. And oftentimes we do that based on how many board feet per acre per year, how many cords per acre per year, or how many cubic feet per acre per year. That's forest productivity from a quantitative standpoint, and that's how many foresters think, and that's oftentimes how some forest landowners think who are interested in growth and yield for their timber product. Here's a chart which you probably can't read because the font is extremely small, but you'll be able to read it on the web. Ultimately, here's some soil series here in Illinois, and we do have some quantitative numbers for the different soil series in this column is the board feet per acre per year that you can expect based on that soil type for certain hardwoods, okay? So the higher that number, the more productive the site, all right? Site index curves, how many of you have ever seen a site index curve or have heard the term site index, okay? Site index is important because it tells you, it's also a quantitative indicator of productivity. The higher the site index number, the taller the trees can grow on a given site. Taller trees will often yield more fiber, okay? High site index, taller trees, greater productivity. Lower site index, shorter trees, lower or poorer productivity, okay? Each tree species and each geographic region in the U.S. has these site index curves. And I put up a black walnut site index curve here. And we always use base age 50. In the Midwest, we use base age 50. So when I say site index equals 60 for walnut, I'm going to site, the total age here, 50. I go up to age, which is on the other axis, and basically I get the site index 60. So ultimately, the lower the site index, the lower or the shorter the trees, the worse the productivity. And there's a general rule of thumb for black walnut. You don't want to grow black walnut on sites with a site index below 60, okay? And your forester who helps you develop your forest management plans, they should be able to give you this data, okay? You're not expected to just know what these numbers mean, but site index is a good quantitative indicator, all right? All right, let's talk a little bit about walnut suitability. And I prefaced this from the very first uh, you know, five minutes of the talk is forcing species that don't want to grow on certain soils or on certain sites. Walnut is one of those species. You can find walnut growing anywhere, but it doesn't mean it's the optimum site, okay? Soil site considerations. You need to think about soil series. So those soil mapping units I showed you earlier, that matters, that counts. You need to know that information. Topography and site selection, all right? Steep slopes, not optimum black walnut growing sites. Soil drainage, it's really important. It can't be excessively well-drained, but it can't be wet. You gotta find that perfect zone, that perfect spot. You gotta have enough soil moisture, but not too much. Depth the water table. I talked about those flatwoods. So if that water table is really high up in that soil profile, those roots are gonna be wet and they're gonna be wet all the time, and black walnut does not like wet roots. All right? Flood frequency. We find a lot of our best walnut development in the riparian zones, right, Mr. Croats? Absolutely. But the water has to be able to get off those sites relatively quickly, okay? It's really important. So that you can have great development down there, but oftentimes those black walnut trees are in a little micro site, just a little mound, just to give them away from that water table, just a little bit. So oftentimes 
just one and a half feet, two feet in the floodplain makes a difference. Those little bounds, those little terraces, really important for black walnut suitability in the floodplains. pH and fertility, obviously very important. You gotta find that optimum zone, about 5.5 to 7.5 is that preferred pH zone for black walnut because it is nutrient demanding. Uh, optimum wall, walnut sites, basically the upper three feet of soil needs to be free of gravel, clay layers, and bedrock. That's for optimum black walnut development. A black walnut will grow there, but you're not going to get those high quality veneer trees on there. Medium textured soils. So black walnut, they love those loams. They love those silt loams, and they do like those silt. And silt really helps with that moisture, that soil holding moisture capacity. And that loam, because you've got to have some decent drainage, but you don't want excessive soil drainage where it becomes droughty. And then that optimum pH range, you know, 5.56 to up to 7.5. So neutral, slightly alkaline, or slightly acidic. That is the sweet spot for black walnut suitability and develop. Optimum sites, or that site index number over 70. Those are the best quality sites. All right, site index over 70. Those are optimum. That's where you get those magnum trees, those big ones, that 26, 28 inches. All right, well-drained floodplains, the terraces, the soils, they have to be deep, they have to be fertile, and they have to be well-drained, optimum sites. North and east facing slopes, they're key because they're slightly cooler and they have more soil moisture. Coves and draws, similar situation. Low slopes, toe slopes, all right, they're cooler, they're out of the wind, but you have to worry about our frost pockets. Black walnut, very susceptible to frost pockets. And mid slopes, foot slopes, toe slopes. So the poor sites, what's a poor walnut site? Anything site index 50 and below, basically that's a poor black walnut suitability site. South and west aspect, steep slopes, poor walnut site. Poorly drained, high flood frequency floodplains. So you're gonna get flooding in the floodplain, that's why it's called a floodplain. But how fast does that water get off? If it gets off real fast, then actually the internal soil drainage is probably pretty good on that site, and therefore it would be an excellent opportunity to plant some walnut. And coarse textured soils, because it has excessive soil drainage, ultimately they will be too droughty. And then soils that are too fine textured. Ultimately your soils have way too much clay, okay? And so the water cannot move through that soil profile if you have too much clay, and so that water sits there, and basically it rots the root system. And here's some uh, defin uh, you know, suitability definitions based on in, uh, Indiana soil types. So ultimately, black walnut suitability, there's suitable sites, somewhat suitable sites, where you not have an optimum growth, but the trees will grow. And then you have your sites that are just totally unsuitable, that you would be unwise or perhaps foolish to establish black walnuts on those type of soils. And this is kind of a similar one because we're running a little slow on time here. We're going to go ahead and do the next slide. White oak suitability, I want to talk about this real quick. So the reason why I bring this up <clears throat> is that uh, the new web soil survey system has a certain checkbox selector that you can pick white oak suitability for your land and your soil types, which is really unique and really helpful because white oak is now one of those species that's in extreme high demand. How many whiskey and wine drinkers do you have out there? Well, that's because of white oak, okay? So now the United States Department of Agriculture, with their web-based soil system, their web soil survey system, they've identified the optimum or white oak sites for you. So if you check that, then you'll be able to look on your map, your soils map that it's generated, and you'll be able to look at the color profile it lays over it, and see if it's a good wall or white oak site. I'm sorry, got walnut fever. White oak site, or it's a poor white oak site. And here's a white oak uh, site index curve as well. So we'll go through that. So here's web soil survey. How many of you have used web soil survey or have heard about it, seen it? How many of you have played with it? Do you feel comfortable with it? Is it relatively, it's relatively intuitive. It's essential for forest planning. And in Illinois, every forest management plan has to have a soils report, and all foresters in the state of Illinois use the web soil survey system. Why? 
because it works, it's easy, and it's outstanding. So if you see a USDA employee, pat them on the back because this system is outstanding. So it's used regularly by all professional foresters in Illinois. I'm sure foresters in Iowa uh, hopefully use, use it as well as in Wisconsin. And ultimately, to make sound forest management or silvicultural decisions or recommendations, you have to understand your soils. So this is kind of what the uh, interface looks like on the web. And basically, you can zoom into your land based on a number of factors. You can put the GPS coordinates in. You can put the physical address in, or you can select your state and your county, and then just start zooming in to where your property is if you don't know the GPS coordinates, or if your land does not have a US address associated with it. So ultimately, you find it, and then you use this AOI button, and basically, you make a polygon around your parcel of land. So basically, you're cutting out what you want a soils report on. All right, so this happens to be the Illini Forest Plantations. This is on the south part of the U of I's campus. So I made a polygon around my 36 acre experimental forest here to help me develop my soils report. And then ultimately, when you finish making your little polygon or complete your little square around your property, it creates uh, an AOI. AOI is area of interest, okay? That's the area that you're interested in creating a soils report for. And then you get these hash marks, and then ultimately it lays the soils, boundaries, perimeters, and soil series numbers. So you start to see these orange boundaries, and then you get the soil series number there, and then you get some color. So it's very unique. It's, very, it's a very pleasant interface because these, unless you're colorblind, um, so these different colors represent different suitabilities or different parent materials, okay? So every color has an associated map with it or a table of contents that explains what that color is. All right, so after you create your area of interest, you have multiple check boxes to create your soils report. And you have to physically select certain things that you want to include in your soils report. Because you can make your soils report about 1,000 pages long, or you can make it 20 pages long with the information you want. So when I do a soils report for a landowner, I want to know pH. I want to know parent material. I want to know walnut suitability. I want to know white oak suitability. I want to know flood frequency. Because those are the most important data that I want to know, those quantitative and qualitative figures. It helps me help them make sound forest management decision. And it's, again, really, really important for afforestation and reforestation projects. How many of you have ever had a CRP tree planting or an EQIP tree planting? Yep. I guarantee your forester, I hope, or he or she basically use this data. That way you can pick the correct species to put on that site. Of that area of interest, basically you get a map unit that tells you what percentage of what type of soil falls within your area of interest. Here's the black walnut suitability index. So this is what the soils report will come back with. This is on my Illini forest plantations. So based on the color, it tells you whether that soil series is suitable or unsuitable or somewhat suitable for the development of optimum black walnut development. It's really helpful really important, all right? You can avoid making a lot of costly mistakes by understanding your forest soil. And then we can also do one for white oak suitability. And just by looking at this, on this property, based on my soils for my plantation here, would white oak be an optimum choice? Absolutely not. My soils simply have way too much clay, and they do. So I have no white oak developing here. And with that, I have to stop because we have to wrap up, but I will take some questions. How they do it, so basically soil scientists, they develop the soil surveys. So they have field, you know, they don't, every, not every three meters, but basically, you know, they go to certain geographic regions and they map, they map these different quads. So however big a quad is, they take a random sample and from that random sample, but they do all the pH tests. They do all the fertility tests, so they do take basically soil samples, send them into the lab, and then put it into this huge database. 
And then that database serves as a relative to the spatial map. Not every square inch, yeah. right. But so, yeah, the, the scale is larger than you think, it's, but it's not as small as you think either. So every quad has been sampled to an extent, but not every meter. Yes, sir. On your soils report, which, which tab do you go to to write down your, check out your characteristics and or the suitability? Yeah, yeah. So vegetative productivity. So basically you go to Soil Data Explorer, suitabilities and limitations for use. The red, it's a highlighted red. And then you have all these vegetative productivity characteristics. You got grape varieties and basically it creates a separate map and suitability index for any type of vegetative characteristic you want. So after your uh, AIO, you go to the, you're looking at the top. Yep, so you press this little button. Tab way at the top when it gets there. Yes. Okay. Yep. And then, then the next tab, the lower down. Correct. Okay. All right. And then basically you click this little dude there, and then basically there's another checkbox that says view. And by pressing view, it throws up those colors onto your AOI, your area of interest. And then, and then you can say, no, I don't want that map. So you have your choices. It's, it's in here. Same thing. Yep, black walnut suitability. So basically you come here, you press this, it get a small drop down and you say view, and then it shows that color on top of your aerial imagery. And then that color is associated with suitable or unsuitable. Yes, sir. Just a cautionary note. Web saw survey is only as good as the underlying mapping. So if the underlying mapping is correct, then all these large interpretations are going to be correct. And the smallest areas we can delineate when we're mapping are about three to five acres because the scale of maps together published. So by yep. the time you're looking at some very detailed area, you might want to get some additional information from the consultant scientist or be especially careful when you're working on the boundary between the soil series. Soils don't change magically and drastically because you run one side of the line or another. It's a gradual transition in most cases. So just use it with a grain of salt. Yep, as with everything. You know, it's part it should be utilized as part of your toolkit. Okay? There are no absolutes in life. That we know. Well a lot of these slides are kind of hard to see, but you get along to the internet or we're gonna be able to see them. The other thing is yes. How much would it cost to have a soil survey? Well, it depends on the intensity. It depends on the intensity of how many samples you want drawn. And, you know, depending on how many original soil series that you may see on your property. I mean, you might have 10 different soil series, or you might have three. The I, I, I'm not a consultant. About $1,000? Okay.